said it every every time we've done this, this is the best part for me because I get to you guys probably have been walking around barefooted in my head for many many years so you know me to some degree but I get a chance to do little mini market surveys with you guys and when you do interviews with journalists it gets a little boring because they ask the same stuff over and over again but you guys get clever <laughs> and it's pretty interesting what you come up with so we're going to go around the room and I'll try my best to answer yes ma'am oh, yeah, you're up first <laughs> <laughs> batter up and all these people who want me in the UK ask who Jonathan is and <laughs> the um, Crimson Island video well, when you say who is he, do you mean personality wise or get a little more specific? I think he played him. Excuse me? Oh, the kid. Yeah. Oh. You know, 20 plus years went by. All the records that were kept on the actors were lost except for a couple of people. But one of them we were able to find, and it was kind of strange the way we found it because we were doing the Crimson Idol for the first time with the movie, and the video was playing behind us, and we got to the UK, and specifically in London, and all the stagehands go, whoa, whoa, look at him, and look at him, and we didn't know what he was, what they were talking about, right? Well, the guy that plays the brother, Michael, mm -hmm. is a guy named Jake Wood, and Jake is a huge star now in the UK, he does a soap opera over there, but you guys all know him, you just don't know you know him. No. <laughs> he has been the voice of the Geico Gecko for 20 years. Oh, really? Yes. Wow. So, wow. but as far as Jonathan, that got lost. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, first of all, thank you for uh, hosting Well, thank course. you. Um, for me, my first exposure to Wasp was uh, Live in the Rock. Uh, eighth grade, uh, Jim Fox having his ticket tape of it. And shortly after, or a year later, uh, the Heavens Children mm -hmm. came out. And the real me was all over MTV. And I just love that song. And I just wanted to know what the connection was about that song, why you picked that, and why that was like the biggest There were four songs that we were looking at. Three of them were Who songs. The one was Behind Blue Eyes. Um, another one, Punk vs. The Godfather from California. And The Real Me. And so we were supposed to start rehearsing all of them. And I got to rehearsal, and I was the last one there. They, everybody was already up on stage playing. And I walked in the room, and it was a big room. I mean, it was probably the length of this corridor, but the same width wide. And so when I walked in, I was kind of in the shadows, and they didn't know I was standing there. And I just stopped, and this thing was coming off of the stage. I got Chris Holmes up there playing guitar, Johnny Rod playing bass, Frankie Benelli playing drums, Ken Hensley playing keyboards. And they were, they were working up the real me. And I listened to this freight train coming off the stage. There were no vocals. Didn't need any vocals. I mean, this, it was awesome. And I stood there and I thought, there is no need to work on any of those other songs. This is it. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's really what it ended up being. We never even tried rehearsing any of the other songs. Yes, sir. So uh, this is something that both my dad and I have a question for you for is like, so for your first albums, or at least for the self-titled two, you seem to have more of like that sexual and seductive aspect of the music, right? But then you get on to more of the album like Headless Children, and there's more of a political view to that album. So what would you say was the reason why you changed that type you of grow and the change? Really? Yeah, sure, everybody does. I mean, lyrics end up becoming like a diary. So if you look back at who you were five years before that, you're not the same person. you got to remember, too, that we had toured for years at that point, and we had seen things. We, we had seen a lot of cool stuff, but we had seen things you could not unsee either. We had been to places that weren't pleasant. And you go to, to some really disenfranchised places in the world. Americans are spoiled. I can say that because I'm one of you, so I know. But we yes. don't understand what we have in this country. Yeah. I've often said that everyone, every American should be required to do two things. Number one, go to Gettysburg. Second, go to Russia and see what's really going on. All the bullshit you see on TV would cease here immediately if people could see with their own eyes what's going on in these places. 
So specifically to your question, I came home. But before I came home, and we had been on the road for three years. We had done a record and a tour and a record and a tour. Got home in 87, but before I got home, I was in New York and I did an interview with the editor from Hit Parader Magazine, and I was burnt. And I wasn't trying to do any of my showbiz shtick or any of that stuff. I was just, I was venting. You know, whatever I saw on TV, I didn't like. Whatever politics, anything, you know, I was just venting. And he calls up my manager, Rod, and he goes, I don't know what's the matter with him. You know, he's just, he's going off. You know, he didn't give me anything to print. Well, they finally print the article, and about six weeks after it comes out, he calls me up, and he says, we've received more mail from this article than any other we've ever had in this magazine. He goes, I'm gonna send you a sample of some of the letters. So he sent me about 100 letters, and I looked at them, and they were all saying the same thing. You know, what took you so long to say this? We knew this was you. Have you ever been in a situation where you were thinking something about yourself, but it took a friend of yours to say it to you to kind of push you right off the edge? Well, that's, that was that arc moment for me. And I said, that's it. So we did the early demos, and Capitol heard the, the early demos, and they said, this is not the record you should be making. You should be making, you know, I want to be somebody part two or whatever. And I said, I'm not that person anymore. I can't do that anymore. And they were moaning and complaining and the record finally came out and it went gold a week later. And so they shut up. And, <laughs> but the same thing happened again when we did the next record with the idol and they heard that and they think, well, you know, you should be doing headless part two. And it's like, you learn Shakespeare to thine own self be true. Yes, sir. Uh, I was going to ask you, what's your favorite performance or venue you had over the years? Probably, I would say the thing that's most fresh in our memory would be the Ryman. We just played a couple of weeks ago. That was a pretty emotional experience for us because we're standing on the same stage. Where I'm standing singing is where they had Loretta Lynn's body about two weeks before we played there. That's the coal miner's daughter. That's, that's royalty. And you're standing on that stage where that woman was laying. How can you not be moved by that? I mean, it's so. And we, after the show was over, we spent probably an hour and a half just walking around the building, looking at everything. I mean, this it's Mecca. You know, it's like there's certain places like Radio City Music Hall, Madison Square Garden, you know, stuff like that. You cannot, no musician can go in places like that and not feel the ghosts of everyone that's been at Elvis Presley, the Beatles. You know, stuff like that. I mean, like I said, this is royalty. Yes, sir. So now that you've been back to the U.S. after 10 years, what's the plan for come back again? I can't tell you. There's somebody that'll take a rubber hose to me if I say everything I know right now. We're going to go to Europe next year, and um, there's stuff going on. Let's just put it that way. So this, this has been wildly successful. This is the first time and probably since the first tour we ever did that I did not want to stand. Everybody's having a ball out here right now. And today feels like the last day of school where you know, you've, you're waiting for it and waiting for it and it finally gets there and you look around and you go, you know, I'm not so sure I want to do this now. Where's everybody going to go? You know, it's, uh, it's a little bit like that. Yes, sir. Um, so if I could too, uh, first of all, thanks so much for doing this. I talked flew to here from Dubai to be here, and uh, you're this close to making my lifelong dream come true. Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> what would it take for me to play the manimal on the drums with you in the band? Oh God! Well, first of all, we don't know the song, <laughs> so that's one minor detail. Any right other there. song? <laughs> um, I, mm. Not necessarily on the stage. Like literally, it's. I've been dreaming about this for 35 years. I appreciate that, but there's <laughs> things that are even out of my control that probably wouldn't be worth doable. Okay, the, court, the second yes, question. Okay. Um, have you ever regretted uh, doing Crimson so early? Because it seems like, like you, you think, you, you've said multiple times that you feel that was the best thing you've ever written. Mm. Uh, have you ever regretted doing it so early so that pretty much ever? the stuff that you were putting out after that were not as, uh, as, so, as, as I mean, highly 
You know, I learned when we were doing our first record. We were over by, you know where the Beverly Center is over uh, by Los Anagan? The record plant used to be over by there. Mm -hmm. And so we, it was a Sunday at about one o'clock in the afternoon. I've told this story a million times, but it always bears repeating because I came in and the engineer, he was the only one that was in there. And I was the first one of the band that was there, so it was just me and him. He was the kind of guy that he was always, he had some crap going on, always telling jokes and stuff like that. Real fun guy to be with. Well, I come in this morning and he's pretty quiet. You know, he's not saying anything. And I knew something was wrong. So after about 30 minutes, I said, hey man, what gives? What's going on? And he sat down for a second. He says, I got a phone call this morning. Marvin Gaye was murdered last night. And so I could tell he was disturbed. And so I said, all right, let's just talk for a while. So we talked for about an hour. And he says, and I didn't know that he had made two records with Marvin Gaye already. So I knew him pretty well. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, the one thing I learned from Marvin, Marvin made records that reflected who he was at that moment in his life. You know, back to your question over there. You don't try to make records based on who you were five years ago or who you think you're going to be or whatever's hot on the charts or flavor of the month or any of that stuff, you make that record who reflects who you are. Because if it's true that all good writers write from truth, that's the only way you can write. You, have, you, you can no longer talk about your girlfriend's red high heel shoes when you've seen too much of the world. You know, you've changed, you've matured, you've grown. You know, so you end up doing things and thinking things you have an accelerated growth when you do what we do. I tell everybody that one of our days is equivalent to three of yours because we're cramming a lot of living into a very, very small space. And it, it does a, a real trip on your head when you do this. So, you know, I took that advice and, you know, oddly enough, <clears throat> where Marvin Gaye was murdered was less than a mile from here. Hmm. And so those things, you know, I mean, those, to me, like I said, I'm kind of a music historian. And that stuff is, for me, like we were talking about Loretta Lynn just a minute ago, that, those things are big deals for me. So. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Thank you very much for everything. You're welcome. Your work has helped me. And I just tell this for over 10 years, more, almost 20. And my questions are very personal. So if you don't feel comfortable to answer, sure. that's OK. The first one is about your real name. Steve. Steve. Or Steven. Steve. With, Steve, without N. Yes, and my second my one. My dad named me after he was an actor named Steve Reeves. Steve, yes, because he was an actor. Steven, okay. And my second question is about what do you think about tribal bands? About so what like, bands? Uh, like cover bands, bands who play songs from others. Hey, what I've do done you? it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, did okay with it. You know, it's not work for me. So it would be kind of hypocritical for me to say I don't like it. You know, okay. you, know you do cover. I, we had criteria for doing covers. Now, I'm not saying everybody has to subscribe to this idea, but we always thought, you know, if you're going to do a cover, you do it for one of a couple of reasons. Either you can do it different, or you can do it better. Now, you can't always do either one of those, but you try, you know. I remember I get, when uh, Headless Went Gold, uh, the Who were doing Radio City Music <coughs> Hall in New York, and I went to present Townsend with his gold record after the show. And he, we talked for a minute and he had his head down and I'm standing kind of like where you are. And he looks up at me like this and he says, must have taken a lot of courage for you to do that song. <laughs> and I knew exactly what he meant. Because that band was a freight train out of control. You know, I mean, that, that's a tall order to duplicate. But he followed it up and he says, but you know, I'll tell you this, he goes, a lot of people have done Who songs and no one has ever done to my song what you've done. And boy, I was 10 feet tall at that point. <laughs> so, if you don't mind me asking, what were a couple of the things that you might have gone through that this helped you? Um, Unless you're not comfortable. <laughs> no, I mean, it's a fair question. No, that's okay. Can you repeat, please? Well, you said it helped you. The music helped you. Yes. Um, for example, when my father passed away mm -hmm. uh, 10 years ago, 
I do was one of the darkest moments for me, and your work helped me a lot. I know I can see myself in your lyrics. It comforts me somehow. You know, this is what, like what are we doing? Like Red FTG is one of my favorite songs. The lyrics are wonderful. Of all these meet and greets we've done, and this is the first time I've ever done it, so we didn't know what to expect. But we kept hearing a couple of questions over and over and over, and one of the questions that we heard more than any was about the song Miss You. Yes, it's beautiful. And I, yes. now, but you gotta remember from the perspective that I wrote it from, I'm writing it from a singular perspective. You try to write where you're hoping other people can identify with it, I had no idea that it was gonna really push buttons in people the way it did. Because, you know, it's like everybody has suffered loss. I lost my dad three years ago. Your you know, daughter. You know, Jason lost his mom a couple months ago. You know, we all suffer that loss. And the one thing I've learned with this is there is nothing you can say to people when they go through that. It sucks. And there ain't no words that any of us can say to any of us that's gonna make it any better. You comfort them as best you can, you know? And if I've stumbled into some lyrics that help people, then that's wonderful. But other than that, I mean, there are no magic words to say, and it just stinks, and I wish it wasn't the way it is. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I don't have any great no? permissions right now. <laughs> My question is about the Love Machine video. Um, did you pick Rick Rosenthal and Tony Moyer to direct and star in it based on them having been in Halloween I 2? Chased, no, I chased Rick Rosenthal because of Bad, Bad Boys. Boys. Yeah, okay. And did you know that Elise Richards, who was one of the naughty nurses in it, ended up being one of the stars of Trick or Treat, a movie you were no on? Oh shit, fit. really? Yeah. I no, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, hey, I got something you didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I. Uh, I pursued Rick with a vengeance. And I remember getting in a, almost a heated argument with him as to whether Sean Penn would or would not be a, me, a leading man in the future. Now, I told him he would. And he told me he will never be a leading man. He's a fucking asshole. That is, you know, and I, we found out who the asshole was later. Yes, sir. <laughs> I have two things. One was the book that you guys were putting out. Right. I'm just kind of wondering if you can update because it just seemed like an awesome thing. And the other one was, uh, you know, I, I know you only played two shows with the Dolls, but like, how did you end up getting in that band? Were you a fan of that band? Did you see them with Thunders? Like, I mean, that's a kind of a big left in place. Sure. You know what I mean? Sure. And, and nobody ever just, everybody just says you played two shows and that's all we know. You know what I mean? I know you're I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to weigh my words here because I can't tell you everything about what was going on at the time. I think for decorum purposes, David's the only one left. If David ever wants to talk about it, I think he's more it would be more appropriate for him to address it. But I'll tell you this much. Sylvain and Johnny were fighting. And Syl had had enough. And so I ran into them, I ran into Arthur, and I had known them for a while already. And he got this strange look on his face when he saw me. He says, come here, I want to talk to you. And so he pulls me over in the corner, he says, you want to join the band? And I, you know, he was drinking, I thought he was drunk, you know, and I says, what are you talking about? And he goes, I'm serious, you want to join the band? So there's a story I'd love to tell you right now, but I'm going to save it for the book. I hate to dangle that carrot in front of you. <laughs> but, uh, um, as far as you know, the book that I'm working on, it's called Tales from the Square Mile. And it's really about me living, I mean, you guys probably all know this area. So from Gower and Hollywood Boulevard to Santa Monica Boulevard and Highland, from that area is a square mile. And the book's called Tales from the Square Mile because I spent the first six years in that square mile. First year sleeping on people's floors. Next year and a half, I was in a closet that was three by 12. And so fast forward a couple of years, end up getting a record deal. I used to be able to look out my bedroom, or my front door rather, and I could see Capitol Records, the tower. You know, but that was Mecca. I mean, that was Beatles, That's Beach Boys. Right there, right? <laughs> so, 
you know, you th you're dreaming about it, but you don't think it's going to happen. But it ends up happening. I spend the next 14 years inside that square mile still. I'm driving a better car, I'm not looking for where my next meal's coming from. I'm not living in the square mile anymore, but I'm still working there. A&M Records, you know, record plant, all that. Some, many times, maybe a block or two away from where I was sleeping on somebody's floor. You know, I heard George Clooney tell the same story two years ago. He was living on the corner of Wilcox and Yucca, and he was living in a closet. I thought it was just me, you know. <laughs> but, you know, guys who go through this can tell you a lot of the same stories. So, anyway, you know, you fast forward. On the corner of Santa Monica and Vine is where Fort Apache, the original Fort Apache studio was that we built to do the idol. Caddy corner or diagonally across the intersection was a laundromat, and I think it's still there. When we first started, we used to rehearse in that laundromat. We'd sit up in the aisles and between the washing machines after nine o'clock at night, and we paid the guy 25 bucks a week. Really? That's, That's so cool. Yeah, and so, you know, fast forward eight <laughs> years, and I'm now the proprietor of the studio diagonally across the intersection. And I would pull up to the studio sometimes, you know, you can't help but see the intersection, it's right there. And I'd look across and I'd see that laundromat. And I'd think, that's the longest 30 yards I ever walked in my life. <laughs> you know, but I mean, this, this book is, I mean, there's a thousand stories like that. And it's just like, you know, how do you survive it? You know, how do you get from point A to point B with your head still somewhat intact? You know, it's, um, it, I think it's gonna be an interesting read. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I just have a question about um, your favorite 80s band. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Other than Wasp, <laughs> of course. I wouldn't even know where to answer that. Um, too many to choose. You know. um, Sister. Quite well. <laughs> You know, I'm like most musicians, you know, we're only, to us there's only good and bad. You know, there's, you know, it doesn't matter what genre that a label is put on it. It's, you know, whether it's country western or it's, you know, anything, you know. So, like I said, I mean, I don't, I don't really differentiate when it comes to that. So. Okay. Yes, sir. It seems like most good bands are lucky to have two or three really good albums. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what your secret is to the longevity and creativity to have, like, 15. You've heard the expression, it's harder to stay there than it is to get there. Mm -hmm. Truer words are never spoken because most bands, most successful bands, make their bones the first five years they're together. You think about their best records, it's usually within the first five years for a number of reasons, but that's where they make or break their audiences right there. If you can get 10 great songs in your career, you can build a career out. You don't have to have 10 great records, you know. So it's, it's really, really hard, but it's also how bad do you want it? Because I've told people a lot, I am not the best at anything. I'm not great at anything. I do several things pretty good, but good by comparison to great looks mediocre. But if you put a whole bunch of good together, you can maybe have a chance if you're willing to work on it. You know, and that's my secret more than anything because I always liken it to the tortoise and the hare. You know, you might beat me in a sprint, but I'll kill you in a marathon because I won't quit. You know, and it's like, you know, Rocky Marciano, I remember asking my dad when I was a kid, you know, if he's not a great fighter, how's he, win how's he the heavyweight champ of the world? He says, because he would let guys beat on him for 10 rounds and then he'd come after you. You know, so that's kind of my philosophy. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't have a question. My English is very short. Mine too. <laughs> <laughs> but I only want to say that I appreciate your career, your music, and I'm from Mexico, and I only come to see the show. Do they know you're here? Yes. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, I shouldn't. Uh, no, no. Thank you, I appreciate it very, very much. I, when the concert finish, I need to go to the art. <laughs> <laughs> see, they're looking for you already. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. I just want to thank you for having us here. I just moved here four months ago, originally Ukraine, and I'm Wasp is my favorite band. So you got out, huh? Yeah. Last time I saw it was Sweden. Well, congratulations. Yeah, I mean, thank you. Last I mean, time it was Sweden, Stockholm, and Yavle. 
Yeah, and mm -hmm. I saw you with the great show, and I just want to ask you if you have any favorite moments from this tour. Well, I w we was talking about the Ryman, just going to go to the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville. And that is really the country western. I mean, if you know about this building, it's, it's been there for over 100 years. It started out as a Baptist church 100 years ago. But it's where all the, the big country western stars used to play. As a matter of fact, when we were doing this show, I, I talked about it and I said, and to be honest with you, I'm astounded they didn't even let me in this building. You know, so it's, um, that, was, that was a big deal for us. Yes, sir. I just want to say thank you for what you're doing. I don't, I don't have a question for you, but like the person said, I lost my father earlier this year in February, and your way of helping me pause and help me work through it. So I just say thank you, and I appreciate everything that you've done. You heard what I said a while ago. There's no easy way out of this. No, there isn't. And you get, everybody's got to deal with it. You know, I was, we had a friend of ours that he works at the Pentagon, and we were in D.C. a couple of weeks ago. He lost his dad right around the same time I lost mine. And you know we were corresponding back and forth and back and forth and just there's nothing you can say, man. This is a walk that each one of us has to do ourselves. I, like I said, I'd love to, to say some magic words, but it just doesn't. It ain't there. Yes, sir. Hi, Black. Um, I've been waiting 39 years to meet you. And Stop it. No, seriously. <laughs> and um, <laughs> friends of mine, friends of mine, ask me, you know, what would I ever say to Black if I could ever meet him? I was blessed enough to say thank you. And I do have a question, a silly, odd, odd little question. I'll be the judge. Question. Huh? I'll be the judge. Okay. <laughs> wait till you hear the question. Um, the main question would be, in 1995, when you were released Still Not Black Enough, at that time I was 25 years old, experiencing sobriety for the first time, I went to college. And that album has such a huge impact. I mean, you talk about time capsules, capsules in people's lives. And in the liner notes, you wrote, that you that fans are allowing you allow fans to walk through your mind and you wrote, I am keenly aware that such a relationship exists. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. When was it that you realized, hey, these fans are coming with me on this journey and, and strap in because it's gonna be a bumpy ride? About halfway through this tour, and I am dead serious. When I wrote and have written the things that I've written, you're writing from a singular position because you're inside a bubble. You know, like I said, all, all good writers try to write from truth, but what you believe to be true. When I did The Idol, as an example, people asked me, who's Jonathan? And I said, well, he's 10% of this guy I know, and 10% of somebody else, and 10% of this guy, 10% of me, roll them all together, and that's what you get. It wasn't until I started really digging into this book, because I came up with about 250 ideas. And, you know, when you're doing this, this is a, was a real discovery process for me. And when I say discovery, I mean just that. Because you come up with an idea. Okay, I was talking about the studio just a second ago. When you're doing that, you gotta stop and really start pulling the layers back because as time passes, you forget the details. You remember the big parts, but you forget the details of it. So you gotta start peeling all that stuff back. And when you go, when you do that, what I found is I was discovering stuff about myself and things I didn't even know. So when I, when the idol was done and I said, yeah, he's 10% of me, I recently began to understand there is more of me in that character than I ever gave a credit for. So again, you know, you write things down, these lyrics become like a diary you keep and you look at them when you write them. And then 10 years later, you look at them again and you go, wow, look at how my thoughts have changed. You know, I don't think like that anymore, or I don't feel like that anymore. So it's, it, it too is a process of discovery. And I would say that I grew more in the two years that I've been working on this book. There's been, of these two years of self-discovery, I've probably grown quicker in a shorter amount of space than I ever have before. So you're talking about that still not black enough. I mean, we were doing that I was lost as a goat, you know, because I had done what I thought the idol was our best piece of work. And so when I got ready to do something else, I didn't know where to go, where to start, how to even begin to approach it, because I'm thinking, you probably can't top what you just did. That's a really bad place to be starting from. That launch point is not really the way you want to be thinking. 
And I went for six months where I couldn't pick up a guitar. And I found out later through a doctor that I was working with because of my back. It's a long story. I don't know if you know anything about kinesiology. But kinesiology is a study of the neurological impulses that come from your brain and go into your muscles and all that stuff. And it affects your, your spine and things like that. We started doing some testing, neurological testing in my back. And through a process, a process of discovery, I found out why I didn't want to write. Because I would look at a guitar in the corner, it was like a rattlesnake, you know, I didn't want to touch it. Mm. And what I discovered was failure. If I don't pick up the guitar, I can't write. And if I can't write, I don't fail. Now, we know logically thinking or speaking that if you don't pick that thing up, you're going to fail. But the subconscious has ways of tricking us, you know, to, I think any anxieties that people have, anything like that is all tied to this. You know, the, the brain is trying to protect us from something we really don't want to know about ourselves. So I went through that, like I said, that, that too was a process of self-discovery. When, when I came to that conclusion, I thought, well, I ain't got a whole lot to lose now, do I? You know, so I picked the guitar up, started writing again. The guitar, I mean, the record, at the time I was finished with it, I thought it was okay. Um, looking at it now, it's better than I gave it credit for. But I think any artist is going to raise the bar pretty high in their head. You know, so you're always going to be trying to grasp something that's just out of your reach. But I think that's part of the artistic torment that goes with it. Yes, ma'am. Um, my question is already been asked, so I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> All good? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Mine was asked as well, but um, I just want to say thank you, because I was raised on Wasp, and it created a bond and just music in general with my dad and if it's okay with you I'd love to give you a hug just to say thank you for, for creating that with you know me and my dad because you know we can't get that relationship back so thank you yes sir um, after 40 years um, you guys could be playing a show you know two three hours long how did you narrow it down to the Tough. set list that you have? Mm -hmm. We had, I mean, that's it's insane. You get you had like a Bruce Springsteen like no opening at three and a half hour show. It's insane. We had over fifty songs we started with. We right. kept whittling it down and whittling it down and whittling it down. When we finally settled on this set list, it was actually a couple weeks into this tour because we kept you know moving parts around and doing this. It's hard to do to just swap things around because of video. There's a lot of moving parts to the show right. you're going to see tonight. So it's a, it's a little bit like a Broadway play in that sense that it's not a, a traditional rock show. Uh, it'll look like a rock show when you see it. Uh -huh. But like I said, there's a lot of moving parts to it. So you just can't, you know, on a whim decide, let's change this song and do that. There's all the crews involved, everybody. Right. So like I said, we started with a whole lot of songs and kept working it down, working it down. We had, I'll give you an example, we had one medley that we worked up that was, what was it? it started out with School Days, 9-5 uh, Nasty, Scream Until You Like It, Ball Crusher, Sex Drive, and Forever Free. Oh. Oh. <laughs> and it worked really great together, but where it was going in the set did not work because of the pacing of it. Mm -hmm. And it literally was a painful amputation, you know, because nobody wanted to take it out, but we all knew it did not work where we were trying to put it in the show. Because a show is kind of like an album. When you put all the pieces together, there has to be like a running order, and there's a pacing to it, and it just didn't work. So that's what it is. Yes, sir. Hi, Mikey. Uh, <laughs> there's only two artists that's ever given me, like, crazy emotional response when I hear the music. First for me was Dio, and second was obviously Wasp. And um, um, I just I was really curious because I saw the, the Dio documentary, uh, Dreamers Never Die, mm -hmm. and saw you on the the Hearing Aid uh, mm -hmm. collaboration that he did. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you can uh, um, maybe talk about you know your experiences interacting with him and how he's. Ken Cragen was the guy that produced that, and Ken was also he passed away like two years ago, but. Ken was the guy that um, 
put together We Are the World, Michael Jackson and you know Ray Charles, all those guys, actually in the same room at a and Records where they had done that. Well, as the story went, Ken had a big sign posted on the front door when you walked in the studio, check your ego at the door. Well, when we got there, the same sign was on the door. But the odd part about it was once you got in the room, the sign was not necessary at all because everybody, you're looking around the room at all those faces you recognize. And if anybody had an ego in there, they didn't show it. You know, because it, it humbles you when you're in there with that kind of talent. And as a matter of fact, Ronnie came out at one point, we, we started the, the group thing where we were in the room. And Ronnie came out after about 10, 15 minutes, he goes, come on guys, loosen up. You know, you're all so stiff out here, you know, it looks like, you know. So that's when I went down and got Kevin on my shoulders, you know, and started loosening up. And plus, there was an open bar, and the longer that went on, the more people got loose. Yes, ma'am. It's not a question, but just thank you for the music. And I was 10 years old when I first heard Wild Child, and I loved it. I love the lifestyle. Now you're scarred for life, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate it. All right, guys. I got to go to work. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.